Thanks, everybody. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Learning Lab's webinar series. I'm Lark Park. I'm director of the Le Learning Lab, uh, and we're really excited to introduce the second in our webinar series. I'm sorry, this is the third in our webinar series. Um, for uh, for uh, all of you uh, who signed up, our webinar is called Shazbot. Uh, can you really do active adaptive asynchronous learning all at once and i suspect many of you spotted the orkian phrase shazbot and maybe that's why you registered uh, but be that as it may uh, our speakers aren't from orc uh, they do live outside california they're from the east coast and they are pleased to talk about active adaptive asynchronous learning uh, specifically the unique capabilities of open adaptive courseware today uh, and as everyone heads into the fall term or is already deeply immersed in it, I do think there is keen interest in understanding how to better connect with students and how to potentially recapture the joy in teaching online. Uh, before I introduce today's speakers, I just wanted to make a brief plug for the last webinar in our summer series, uh, which is taking place next Wednesday at 1 p.m. called Don't Be a Robot. Uh, lessons on how and why to humanize online teaching. So we'll hope, we hope you'll make time for that one as well. Um, so let me introduce our speakers today, David Wiley and Norman Beer. Um, they are actually connected to one of Learning Lab's projects called Community Source Data-Driven Improvements uh, to Open Adaptive Courseware. And that's hosted out of Santa Ana College with CSU Fullerton, uh, UC Berkeley, and Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative as its main partners. Uh, so David Wiley is the Chief Academic Officer of Lumen Learning. He's an adjunct fa faculty member and director of the Open Education Group at Brigham Young University. Uh, he's also a Simon Fellow at Carnegie Mellon uh, and an Education Fellow at Creative Commons and an Ashoka Fellow. Uh, he has a PhD in Instructional Psychology and Technology from BYU. Norman Beer is the Executive Director of the Simon Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and he's also the director of the Open Learning Initiative at Car Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he holds a master's in philosophy from CMU. Um, and Norman, who says philosophers can't be wildly successful, right? So uh, I routinely ask our speakers to share something personable, personable and personal about themselves, so you'll remember them. Uh, for David, he's achieved what I think many of us can only dream of at this point. He's finally turned a large six by 12 foot walk-in closet into a small but full-fledged recording studio. Uh, so David, we congratulate you and we envy you. Um, who knew that a small, private, quiet space would become the new gold standard uh, in our lives? And Norman Beer, uh, he considers himself a lucky traveler. Uh, back when he was attending a conference in Niagara Falls, New York, he mistakenly booked a hotel room in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. So he had to cross the border each and every day. And it was by sheer dint of luck that he was not pursued as suspect by border patrol or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, and also based on his travel patterns earlier this year, he just either eluded the hotspots of COVID having traveled to both New York City and Seattle at inopportune times, or he might have been patient zero. Norman, I hope that's not the case or you'll have CDC after you as well. Um, so in any case, I know that both David and Norm are eager to help put the joy back in teaching with open adaptive courseware. Uh, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Team Shazbot. Thanks so much for the uh, introduction and thanks so much for having us here. Um, I will confess that it is always a real joy to be able to co-present with David. Um, you know, we have the chance to do a lot of work together, but uh, we're not always sharing a stage or a Zoom. I need a quick couple of notes before I dive in. Um, as you noted, I am the executive director, director of a project called the Simon Initiative at CMU. Uh, at its most basic level, the Simon Initiative is this intent uh, to follow up on a challenge from Herb Simon, who was really committed to improving post-secondary education and who believed that uh, you know, we weren't gonna do that by simply having folks standing at the front of a room talking behind a podium. Instead, we needed to commit ourselves to this work as research, uh, treat it as research that was as serious and as important as work in our own domains and work on this together. And so um, you know, David is a large part of this community. We hope that you'll take this presentation and consider it as an opportunity to engage with that community. Join us in this work. Uh, and as you already noted, one piece of this work that we're really excited about, part of our connection to um, 
the Learning Lab project is a current effort uh, where we're actually leveraging open and adaptive courseware. I see some of my colleagues uh, have, have joined us on the participants list, which is fantastic. So if you're in California and interested in learning more or participating, uh, drop us a note. We're happy to talk a little more about how OLI and Lumen are engaging with our partners. So what are we here for? Um, the reality is that adaptive courseware is still in its infancy, uh, although significant investments from foundations have really increased the visibility of it. So you've probably been hearing a lot about adaptive courseware so far, and you're going to be hearing more about it. And so in some ways, we're looking to give you an overview that's going to serve you currently, um, hopefully serve you well into the future as adaptive courseware matures, but also hopefully we'll give you some tools to be able to talk about and use these kinds of courseware effectively. And we want to use this as an opportunity to show some real connections that you can make using these tools back into effective and uh, teaching and learning practices. So too often we think there's a sense of technology as, uh, as, as being cold in comparison to the human connections we make in our instruction or of building walls between learners and uh, educators. We want to take this chance to um, really highlight some of the ways that we see these technologies helping to build more robust interactions and better relationships with students. Uh, I just wrapped up a semester using this stuff and so I've got a few tips to share there. As we go, we'd really like to encourage participation with all of you, uh, but as you're aware, that's a little hard to do in the Zoom session. Um, so we're going to be periodically asking you to answer some questions. Uh, at the minimum, use the yes and no buttons down at the bottom of your screen, and we're trying to save a lot of time at the end for a conversation and for questions. So what are you going to be hearing from us? Well, you're going to be hearing a lot of uh, different phrases, repeated, open and adaptive courseware, active asynchronous learning, and uh, some talk about flexible hybrid delivery. These are things that we'll uh, want to unpack a little bit and hopefully set the stage for a larger conversation. But diving into that, sort of straight off the bat, let's put those yes and no buttons to use. How many of you in the room needed to pivot to remote delivery in the spring? Uh, how many of you have already been living this life? Well, some of you, okay. And how do we, how do we vote on this? Oh, if you, uh, on the participants list, there's a um, yes and no option, as well as some uh, additional things, but the yes and no are the points that are uh, usually easiest to jump to. Very good. Uh, yeah. So Pete, down yeah. at the bottom where, where it says participants at the very bottom center. No, I, I got it. I got it. Okay. So looks like a lot of you have already lived through this. And I'm curious, how many of you are expecting to also need to uh, be remote in the fall? And I think that this is, um, even for those of us that aren't planning for fully remote delivery, a lot of you feeling like you're going to need to at least plan for a hybrid delivery mode, a little online, uh, maybe some face-to-face. -face. Even split, pretty good. Um, and of those of you that are currently planning for a hybrid, uh, just to get a sense of whether we have any uh, optimists or cynics in the, uh, in the room, how many of you expect to end fully remote? <laughs> A few more optimists in the room than I uh, than I expect, and that's fantastic. Hopefully, you're able to uh, hopefully you're able to do that. What do you uh, mean last... fully remote? Do you mean like we'll die doing fully remote, or oh, fall semester? Sorry, even I'm not that cynical. Uh, so simply that we're going to be starting. So, with, uh, what we're expecting here in Pittsburgh, and what I know a lot of uh, other schools have looked to, is some hybrid mode where we're planning for more flexible delivery. We're going to have some in-person instruction. Uh, and some remote instruction. And we're already seeing as the semester has kicked off, a lot of folks have needed to make a transition to uh, fully remote modality. Likely more of us will, whether as individuals or as institutions. And so some part of the way that we'd like to talk about and think about courseware are the ways that it's able to support both of those approaches. What kinds of flexibility can it, uh, can it lend you? So, um, and it looks like we've actually got a pretty good mix as I look through some of the answers popping up on chat. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by adaptive courseware before I dive in. Um, and we'd ask, generally speaking, what do you think of when I say adaptive courseware? Uh, it looks like uh, some subset of you have been using adaptive courseware, so some of you already have a, have a sense, but um, any thoughts? What do we think about? Words in chat, if anybody wants to jump on and uh, chime in. I 
Alex courses, so some uh, mathematics, the ability to uh, deliver problems, a good one. AI, just uh, past answers, directing and uh, guiding, this is good. So you guys are a little more, um, you guys are jumping directly to the technology, which is exciting. I think oftentimes, um, and it seems like we've got a lot of uh, Alex, oh, Nick, you set me up. Perfect. So often what we end up hearing about is a choose your own adventure style of learning. We talk about these as branching activities. So this notion that based on any given decision that a student makes, uh, we're able to hand them, whether by instructor selection or computer selection, the next chunk of content. Um, and we often see a lot of systems getting their start and a lot of educators getting their start using these kinds of choose your own adventure models. Um, do you think that this pure branching approach is a good approach? Um, how many of you feel like this is, a, this is a good idea, a good way to get started with adaptivity? A few of you? How many of you don't I'm want to sorry, answer questions? You can ignore me if I'm getting to be a problem, but I, I don't understand what this choose your own adventure is. Sure. So. When we think about different approaches to adaptivity, one of the simplest approaches that we see ends up being a, a branching scenario. And so uh, folks often think of adaptive learning as a set of different content chunks where we're going to branch off the content, hand learners different pieces of content, whether this is different sets of problems or different sets of readings or exposition based purely on one or more questions that they've asked. And so in its sort of simplest model, it really is just a set of branches that ends up requiring requiring significant amounts of content uh, and can often end up having a fairly common set of paths or a common set of experiences um, across the learners. And so when we get started with adaptive learning, this tends to be a place that a lot of systems will get started. Uh, and so it's often a place where a lot of educators and uh, instructional designers end up um, you know, re really sort of uh, you know, getting their first taste of what adaptive might be. But there's a question about whether this is really the best way to take advantage of different kinds of content. Uh, you know, what is it that we're adapting in this case? We're thinking about adapting the, uh, the materials themselves. And what I was hoping to do was use this as an entry point to talk about and, and think about other ways of approaching adaptivity and other ways of approaching adaptive courseware. I'm gonna confess here that uh, I'm gonna start off with something that's a little more uh, learning science-y hopefully give you something to, to, uh, to walk out of. So when we talk about adaptivity in the learning sciences, uh, we often end up using these phrases of the outer loop and the inner loop, sort of something defined by uh, Kurt von Lane, an uh, early paper back in 2006, with this notion that when we are trying to adapt our instruction, whether you are a human being providing tutoring to a student, whether you're software trying to uh, emulate a tutoring system, at the most basic level, what we're trying to do is give a student a problem to solve. That problem often has some subsets, sub steps based on the student's response, based on their ability to go in and uh, answer some of those questions or solve some of those steps. We give the students feedback. We give them hints that are targeted to their current mistakes, their current misconceptions. And based on performance on those steps, we can then take a step back and select for new kinds of problems, new kinds of tasks. And again, when we take software out of this completely, as I'm not talking about courseware, but really one-on-one -on -one instruction, uh, students sitting beside an educator, this is a model that allows us to adapt both the kinds of feedback and hints that I'm able to provide to the student, uh, but also to adapt the kinds of materials that I'm handing them, the kinds of problems, the kinds of tasks, even the kinds of exposition or the kinds of explanation that I'm providing. And so this notion of an inner loop and an outer loop ends up playing out in lots of different ways when we think about how we might adapt instruction. Inside of courseware, we tend to think about that adaptivity on two different levels. So system adaptivity, which is really uh, for most of us computer adaptivity, right? So it's a courseware that's going to be able to provide different kinds of targeted hints, feedback that really drills in on learner misconceptions, or that's able to provide different kinds of problems and task selection. And this ends up, um, 
bubbling up in a lot of the examples that have already popped up. I think that the, uh, the Alex system is one that does a really nice job actually of identifying new kinds of problems based on learner performance. We can look at this as trying to build out different kinds of content pathways. Uh, and at a much grander scale, we can look at this as orchestrating larger sets of course or curricular materials. But really what we're drilling into with this notion of system adaptivity is that it's the computer making decisions on behalf of a learner or an educator. So what's adapting here is inside of the computer. And we like to contrast that with a different kind of adaptivity. How is it that adaptive courseware can support human beings to make changes? Whether this is supporting our learners in making some problem level decisions, uh, letting them adapt in terms of the kinds of answers that they give, whether we give them better support in trying to make decisions to select their own content. And this is a different vision from many of the systems that we saw cited, right? It's a, this is a contrast between a system that's simply going to be handing the next set of problems to students, saying based on your last answer, here's the next set of content, but rather allowing them to engage in more active decision making and starting to make some decisions that influence their own learning. Similarly, these systems need not just change content, we're also able to leverage what we know of the learner's path through these systems and allow educators to adapt. Whether this kind of adapting is giving different communications and engagement with your students, whether it's creating new kinds of learning activities, changing pacing. So one model here, and one that we're gonna be diving into is not necessarily how do we understand system level adaptivity, but how can we leverage some of the affordances in adaptive courseware to either support our students in changing or to changing our own instruction. Uh, the slides are going to be distributed after this, but if you're interested in some other ways to jump in and think about adaptivity, uh, we've got a couple of examples here of how learning scientists have been approaching it, uh, how some economists have been looking at the way that uh, adaptivity has been changing in the market, and some folks down at Stanford who have some real concerns about where we might be headed with adaptive learning. So if stuff's interesting for you, uh, there's lots more to read. But for concrete example today, what we really want to think about when we think about adaptive systems is some combination of these elements that are going to allow new kinds of experiences that can enact learning, that can support our learners, allow them to change their behavior, but that can also provide insights and opportunities to you as an educator. And this piece is important because really what we're thinking about when we think about adaptivity is a different Herb Simon quote, uh, and that is that when we are really trying to support students and cause learning to happen, our only window into that is to try to influence the things that students are doing, things that students are thinking. And so we really need to think deeply about uh, how we're going to provide those kinds of influences. David, do you want to take over? Thanks. Yeah, so I want to spend a minute just talking about what is active learning. That's another phrase we said that we would talk about today. Um, Norman, if you'll move on to the next slide there. I just want to ask everybody, uh, again, in using that yes or no uh, feature here in Zoom, how many of you have used active learning online uh, in the past? Excellent. Yeah, a lot more 50-50 split on this one. Well, this is, in fact, a trick question um, because now all of you have. Because participating in this kind of uh, work where you're either responding to a question in a chat or responding to a question with a yes or a no, even just something that small creates a big difference between an experience of just sitting back and kind of half listening and not being fully engaged versus needing to interact, needing to respond, needing to answer uh, or, or click on a yes, no or something like that. Uh, go ahead, Norm. So, you know, Coming back to this quote, when we think about active learning, um, if you really believe that learning results from what the student does and, and what they think and only from what they do and what they think, then this question of what do we ask the students to do, how do we ask them to think, what kind of activities are we getting them engaged in becomes a super important one. Uh, go ahead, please. So, and as we talk about active learning for the rest of the, uh, webinar for the rest of our time together, I just want to point out a couple of uh, reasons why it really is worth thinking about active learning and thinking about how to, be, how to build active learning uh, into your courses. And I want to do that first with a paper, and this is really fun because this is a paper that Norman uh, was a co-author on, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so it's always fun to talk about a paper when the author is uh, around. But in this paper, they talk about what they call the doer effect. 
And the doer effect is basically looking at the difference in learning between students who are having more of a kind of laid back, less engaged kind of experience like watching a video or reading a textbook, as opposed to students who are actively engaged in what the paper calls an online interactive practice activity. And they draw out some pretty significant differences in learning between the students who are engaged in that interactive exercise versus the ones who are uh, just reading or watching. Go ahead, Norman. Uh, this next slide is an example. Uh, it, if it looks pretty straightforward, it is pretty straightforward. It's just asking the students to label the parts of the brain and giving them a little feedback about whether they're getting that correct or not. Even something as simple as an exercise like this, you might look at it and say, I thought this is about artificial intelligence. I thought this is about all this whiz bang stuff. This just looks like I'm dragging and dropping labels onto images. Even something this simple as getting students to think, to engage, to make attempts, to get some feedback, and creating those little loops um, that really are just so much more effective uh, in supporting learning than simply reading or watching video. Go, go ahead, Norman. Um, this is another example of uh, what an interactive activity might look like, something that's um, slightly bigger. This is a multi-step problem. Um, and Norman, if you'll just move through uh, the next slide or two here, you can see that students are uh, you know, making attempts to demonstrate their understanding. They think they know what's going on. They answer. They get some corrective feedback that says, no, that wasn't right. This is what's right. Reload this. Try again. Here they're getting immediate feedback. It's not just telling them it's right. It's telling them why they were correct. So, um, you know, the degree to which we provide feedback, the kind of feedback we provide, the timing with which we provide it, these interactive practice opportunities allow us to provide immediate feedback that is reinforcing if the students were correct so they, we can deepen their understanding and their confidence if they actually understand the concept or correct them right in the moment when they're wrong with some corrective feedback to help them immediately shift and improve their understanding uh, before they go on. And uh, if you go ahead, Norman, as I said a minute ago, this type of work is really high impact in terms of student learning. Uh, in this one study that Norman was a part of, they found looking at 12,500 students in four different courses, they found that the learning effect of doing these kind of interactive practice activities is six times greater than the effect of simply reading. And they found a similar effect when they compared it to watching video. If you'll go forward again, Norman. Um, but I don't want to just give you one study to think about. Here, uh, this Freeman 2014, this is a meta-analysis of 225 studies that in some way were comparing active learning to more traditional learning, which is more of that sit back kind of either be in a lecture or be watching a video or just reading online. And you can see here that what they found was that when active learning was being used, that students' uh, scores improved by 6%. Uh, on their exams, and also that students who are in the traditional kind of non-active learning settings were one and a half times more likely to fail than students who are in the active learning settings. And again, this is from a meta-analysis of 225 studies. So the effects of active learning are very well documented, they're very stable, and it's very high impact. So that's part of why we're talking about it and, and uh, kind of having such an emphasis on it here in the webinar. So just to give you a couple of examples of what that looks like in asynchronous and in synchronous settings. In an asynchronous setting, it could look like those interactive practice activities I was showing you a minute ago. It could be formative or other low stakes assessments that might look exactly like the kinds of questions students are gonna have on an exam. But here there's no points assigned to them or maybe just participation points assigned to them to get students in really checking to see, am I understanding, am I not? And doing that in a low risk way where they don't feel like, oh my gosh, if I expose a misunderstanding I have here, I'm going to be penalized for that. Um, simulations and games are also other great examples of uh, places where students have to go in and think and configure and move things around. Um, they have to actually engage and interact with the system. And that can, those can all be done asynchronously, of course. On the synchronous side, if you're teaching uh, and you have opportunities like this, we're online in a, a Zoom or something like that, you can do polling and surveys like we've done here. If you're unfamiliar with Kahoot, I'd encourage you to go have a look at that. It's a very kind of fun quizzing tool that you can use with students. It's become quite popular. Uh, other things like surprise presentations, which is uh, something that I do a lot, uh, where in this case, I ask students to prepare a, a two minute, two slides, two minute summary of the readings for the day and then at the beginning of class essentially spin a wheel 
and random, randomly choose students to uh, kind of step up and talk about what the high level uh, topics of the day were about and questions that they had, or think, pair, share sorts of activities. Um, you can do these synchronously as well. Uh, and so this, if you go online and Google, of course, examples of active learning for online classes, you can find huge lists that are compiled there. Um, but we just want to give you a sense uh, of a couple of those here during the webinar. And so we've got lots of different techniques and approaches for building out opportunities for active asynchronous learning. Uh, two of the ones that we want to highlight are from the kinds of courseware that our organizations provide. And so inside of the Open Learning Initiative, uh, OLI is a combination research and production project that's been going on at Carnegie Mellon for nearly 20 years. Uh, we build courseware that combines targeted learning outcomes with expository content and the kinds of active learning activities that David was asking about. So what's interesting is that when we're building those kinds of learning activities, on the one hand, you're giving students that chance to get immediate targeted feedback in the problem solving context, really, really important. Uh, but as they're answering these types of questions, they're also generating data. We're able to capture these uh, learning interactions and use it to, survive, to provide other kinds of feedback loops. So on the one hand, giving information back to the learner about their immediate performance and their performance over time, but we're also able to weave this together in ways that can support you in adapting your own instruction. One example of this, uh, this is an example that we call the learning dashboard inside of OLI. So the notion which you're looking at is that if all of our learning activities, quizzes and assessments are tied back to learning objectives, then as students engage with different opportunities inside of the course, we're able to make predictions on their current estimated learning level. And so as an educator, I'm able to assign a set of modules inside of OLI. In this case, this is a module in our probability and statistics course, asking students to work through and uh, learn about examining distributions. I ask students to complete this before class. And then as I'm heading into class, I'm able to look to see students in the green are ones that we think are doing well, uh, learning well. Students in the yellow have a medium uh, level of learning. Students in the red are ones that we think really have a low level of learning. And in the gray, these are students who simply have not done enough work for us to make a prediction. And what this gives me is the chance to quickly identify what are the learning outcomes that are giving students the greatest challenge. I can drill down to see what are the sub skills that are causing them issues and even drill down to the level of seeing what are the questions that they're answering. What kinds of answers are they giving and what kinds of misconceptions does this demonstrate. And so this gives me the chance to start creating new kinds of learning activities that target those misconceptions, whether that's when I'm walking into the classroom or when I'm prepping my zoom session. Now, I'm going to give you a slightly better live version of that. Do a quick demo. And there is nothing scarier than live demonstrations of technology. We'll see how we manage. Um, so this is the OLI learning dashboard. This is a live example of it. And again, what we're looking at is uh, module in statistics, examining distributions. You can imagine if I'm getting ready to teach this that I wanna do a quick eyeball to see, all right, here are some places where my students are doing okay. Here are places where they seem to have a little more of a challenge. And so I can drill in to see who are the learners in each of these categories. Uh, you can see that this Norman Beer fellow just not doing very well at all. Um, but also who are the learners that simply aren't doing enough work. And we're able to use these to contact the students, but also to drill a little deeper to see what are the kinds of problems they're answering? What are the kinds of answers that they're able to give? Now, if I were a statistics instructor, this would end up being the kind of place where I can jump in and say, all right, I see that students are confusing uh, symmetric unimodal with um, different kinds of skew. And so I can alter my learning activities in ways that are going to be useful. Sometimes this gives me the chance to really quickly see that something's going wrong. So in this case, it's pretty obvious where I should be spending my time and attention. Uh, this is a module in our evidence-based management course, and it's obvious that uh, students aren't doing a great job of understanding uh, and determining what the assumed problem is for which evidence should be consulted. And so that gives me one set of activities. But Equally likely is that when I get uh, my learning dashboard pulled up, I end up getting a set of uh, answers like this. And so this isn't always giving me a really crisp set of ways that I need to be modifying my instruction. 
but this ends up being fairly useful to me in other ways as well. So as you can imagine, making those decisions on how to create new kinds of uh, learning activities, while I just fired that off as though it were really easy, right? You're just gonna waltz into class and create some new learning activities. The reality is that being able to adapt your instruction that quickly and on the fly ends up being really challenging. It's a different kind of work than we normally do. Um, one of the most valuable things that I've been able to do in my own instruction uh, when, when has been taking advantage of this OLI courseware when I teach computer science because it keeps reminding me that this work is really hard and this is part of the place that we need a larger community to start sharing out these types of activities, different approaches. But the other way that this becomes useful is that I end up sharing this information directly with my students. So you can see that as this dashboard is configured, there's nothing that is intentionally showing off my students' names, nothing that's giving any sort of identifying characteristics. And so I talk to my students a lot about the fact that I'm using this dashboard. I'll assign it, I'll tell them that this is going to give me information that I'm going to use to change the class. And then I will often start off my class by showing off specifically these maps and asking them, look, here it is. here's what the courseware is telling me about where the class is. Is this aligning with your own experiences? I'm going to be spending my time on these topics because these are the kinds of answers you're giving. And this has a couple of outcomes for me. One of them is that it pretty quickly shows the students that they have an impact on the direction that the course is headed. Uh, what I found this summer is that that was even more important in a fully online modality than it is when I'm doing face-to-face -face instruction. That sense that the work that they're doing outside of class is really having a direct impact on our synchronous class time. And it also starts to give them a different set of options and approaches as they choose to engage with the material. And this gives me a chance to start to engage with them at a metacognitive level. Sort of beyond these types of uh, mastery displays though, the software also supports a number of different open-ended approaches. And I take use of those in some different ways. So we talk about these as my response activities, in which we're asking students to self-evaluate against the stated learning objectives in the course. And we'll ask students to provide us with uh, the kinds of questions that they have, the kinds of muddiest points. And you can see here, that this is a different way that I can show to the student, both that I can get insight into where the students are, but also this is something that I can project at the start of class and show them, where do you sit in this scale? Um, you know, you shouldn't need to feel as though you're really having trouble by yourself. Other students are uh, struggling with some of the same topics. Beyond the self-evaluation, we're able to hide student names and explicitly ask for questions along the lines of, what concepts are the least clear to you? And this gives me some specific areas that I know that I need to dig into. Uh, it also gives me a check against what the automated materials are showing me. And again, this is another way to involve the students in what's coming out of these courseware systems. Um, as they start to see, these are the kinds of questions. I'm not the only ones that's struggling. And so as we continue in the class, I tend to see these kinds of responses getting richer, getting more useful, and frankly, also getting a little more vulnerable. And so these end up being an opportunity for me to make more direct connections with my students, sometimes as a group as we're talking in the class, but also to drill in and see where it is that they're having trouble on an individual basis. Um, beyond this aggregate view, I've lost my example. There we go. Beyond the aggregate view, we're able to drill in and see some of these estimates for individual learners, uh, which can also be really helpful as you're consulting with students. They're able to see these same estimates themselves, as well as a set of where are the activities that relate back to these that are most likely to provide support. And so what we're also able to do with these tools is start to guide students in developing their own approaches to metacognition. Uh, you know, giving this visibility into the system, I think, helps to develop trust, helps them to place themselves in the class uh, amongst their peer group. But it also gives them these opportunities to start making the kinds of decisions that I think will guide them well throughout the rest of their college career, uh, which is a different way to think about adaptivity than simply handing them the next set of problems and making these decisions on their behalf. And just a second, David, I've lost my screen share. It was a little too clever for, uh, for my own good.
No worries. I'll go ahead and start talking about the next part while you find those and, and reshare. Because I think as, um, oh, or go ahead. There you go. Yeah, so, you know, when you hear the phrase adaptive learning, one of the things that might uh, occur to you is, well, adaptive, we're using AI, we're using technology, we're going to try to replace teachers with technology. I'm going to become disconnected from my students. And you can, it's easy to imagine all the ways in which uh, something that's called adaptive or that's using artificial intelligence or something might, might disconnect you from students. And I think for a lot of us that teach, I think those interactions with students are some of our favorite parts of the job and why we got into it in the first place. So I wanted to talk just a little bit and go ahead on to the next slide here, uh, Norman. Talk about ways that uh, in the context of Lumen's courseware called Waymaker, uh, things that we can do to connect and stay connected and maybe even get better connected with students uh, than you can when you're not using uh, this kind of adaptive courseware. So uh, Norman, if you go ahead here, we're just gonna highlight a couple of sections of this. I didn't want, I was not gonna do a live demo. I, Norman was very brave, that was great. But uh, in this dashboard here, here are some uh, made up students. And you can see here that it's telling you, here are some students who have taken their first attempt on the quiz. They didn't do very well. They failed to, to reach the mastery threshold that you set uh, when you configured the course and set it up the first time. Uh, even though they were in there kind of using the formative assessments, doing the things you asked them to do. That's why these students are showing up on this dashboard. Go ahead, uh, Norman. Uh, so you see here we've uh, clicked on one student and expanded it out. It's telling us that Daniel took this quiz. He only got 60% on the quiz. And here are specifically the two outcomes that he seems to be struggling with. Uh, if you'll go ahead, Norman. The kind of um, the piece here where we tried to really make this easy is in this actions column. So it's not just a dashboard that you kind of look at and wonder what to do, but it says, here's Daniel. He's had these problems on the assessment. He failed to achieve mastery. Let's send him a message. So go ahead and uh, go two slides forward. There's where you click on message and keep going, Norman. And when you do that here, the system, oh, go back one. The system has a templated message um, that you have an opportunity to adjust the template so it can sound like whatever you want it to sound like. But basically, when you have a student who's struggling, you just click the message button. This message is already written. The information about the topics or the learning outcomes that, in this case, Daniel is struggling with are already in there. And I can just, with one click, send a message that says, hey, Daniel, I can see you're struggling. Like, I can see specifically you're struggling with these two ideas. Can we please get together so we can talk through these and I can help you get back on track, either office hours or coming on the phone or Skype or Zoom, whatever works best for you. Um, and so, again, it's a way of using data to help you understand, you know, Norman showed an example of how to, you might adapt what you're doing for an entire class. This is an example of what you might do to really connect with one student invite them in, and then when they do show up for those office hours, or they call you on the phone, however you decide to contact them, that you know exactly what to talk about. You can help them correct misunderstandings that they have and get right back on track. Okay, Norman, go ahead, thanks. Um, but you may not just want to ask questions or send messages when uh, students are doing poorly because you think they need some help. You might also like to send them some messages when they've done a good job, for example, to provide them some encouragement. Um, Norman, I think you can click through uh, two or three here until nice work is highlighted down there at the bottom. So here are some automated messages that uh, in this case can go out to students anytime that they um, you know, exceed the mastery threshold that you've set. There's a series of these that are templated out again that will put in the student's first name, the topic of the quiz, and just send them a quick note that says, hey, that was great work on that quiz. It looks like you're learning a lot. Like, keep up the good work. Just in these little touch points where students get an email from you, even when you describe to them at the beginning of the semester how everything works and how you've configured this so that this messaging uh, can help you kind of multiply yourself to be keeping track of everybody and contacting them. Even though they know this first message is generated by the system, uh, the kinds of replies to these emails that come back from students about what, how terrible their day was going, how much the encouragement meant to them, um, you know, they're really struggling in the class for this personal reason about what's happening at work or with this family member who's gotten sick and how much they appreciate you reaching out. And yes, they will come to office hours. All those kinds of interactions are just so awesome and help you feel so much more connected to your students, not just feel more connected to them, but be more connected to them in ways that let you support them in a really authentic 
genuine manner. And so adaptive courseware isn't just about replacing teachers with AI and making good choices about these you know, branching paths that Norman was talking about in the beginning, but there really are ways that we can marshal the data and marshal the technology to support us as faculty in making deeper, more personal connections with our students and being able to support them much more effectively. And I think that's the last of that section, Norman, if you. Yeah, um, and, and just to piggyback on, uh, on, on David's comment, I think it's, it's increasingly clear that this synchronous time that we have with students, whether this is in the classroom or whether it's via a Zoom session, uh, is, is incredibly precious, really, really valuable. And so we've really been trying to put our effort not into building systems that are going to adapt um, in, in ways they're simply making decisions for the students or making decisions on behalf of the instructor, but can provide some venues for taking that precious time and helping you to make different kinds of use of it. Uh, and hopefully this is a way to, to really push on those uh, interpersonal relationships. I'm gonna move really quickly through this. Uh, in the talk discussion, we talked about the importance of open adaptive courseware. Uh, probably hearing lots of different courseware providers out there. And we think that having uh, open elements to the courseware is pretty important. Why? Well, to start off, it was a grant requirement from our sponsors, uh, but I actually believe in it beyond that. So it's not merely that they require it. When we think about open content, when we start talking about the kinds of materials that we're able to put out in the world, traditionally, our approach has been one that all of you have seen. Uh, you take content that's created, you copyright it, and by copywriting it, you are saying very explicitly, I am reserving all of the rights to this material. Um, if anyone wants to acquire those rights, if you want to make use of this material, then you need to form some kind of relationship or contract with me. Pretty complicated, right? Uh, any of you who have ever needed to deal with the university's uh, Office of General Counsel know negotiating licenses with anyone is, uh, is difficult. Imagining trying to do this for lots and lots of different pieces of content is incredibly challenging. And yet, for most of us as educators, we're not interested in reserving all of our rights. Instead, we've got this interest in being able to take learning materials and share them out in some ways. And so to do this, we have a set of licenses that have been created by Creative Commons. It's this notion of building out an easy mechanism to share content around something that is a commonly understood license and commonly, uh, commonly accepted. And so I can say, for anyone that would like to use my materials, here are the terms that you're going to be able to use them without needing to go and negotiate a fresh round of contracts with the attorneys. What these types of licenses support, something that we talk about in the open community, are certain things, that certain rights that you maintain to this content, whether it's you as an educator or whether it's your students who are making use of these materials. Uh, we talk about these as the five R's. So it's retaining this ability to reuse materials, uh, this ability to make changes to them, to revise them, to put them together with other kinds of content and remix them, and to take that remix and put it out into the world. Lastly, on this list, we talk about the um, ability to retain the right to continue to use, make, change, and archive this content. This is fairly important. So some of this starts to feel a little philosophical. You know, is it important that your learners have the ability to retain their content? But in fact, as we see more and more content being pulled into adaptive systems that are often proprietary, that ability for your learners to say, you know what, I'm not able to lose my access to this. I will always retain the right to be able to use it. It becomes increasingly important. So open content when plugged into adaptive learning systems actually gets you an awful lot. Uh, ongoing rights, but also this ability to build on the work of others, creating new content and modifying things that others have created. I mentioned earlier that within both of our courseware platforms, the content has been mapped back into learning objectives and into skills. This represents an awful lot of work, really more work than any one individual can do. And so you're able to tie on to that work, make use of it. Similarly, questions of accessibility and addressing learner variability end up being things that can be baked into open content. Um, Beyond this, there are really opportunities here to take greater part in questions of equity and inclusion, of customizing your materials to, uh, to address specific learner needs, and to contribute to that research base that I mentioned earlier. Looking beyond content, um, so it's important that the content be uh, open, but we've also mentioned a few times and alluded to the role that algorithms and analytics play. 
we know that the kinds of software that we build, the algorithms and tools that we're building have a very real risk of having bias introduced, right? It's something that we see in the news all the time, uh, sometimes in the realm of healthcare, but sometimes in the realm of post-secondary education. And this is a real concern. We don't want to be building out tools that are going to take inequity and deepen it. Um, this doesn't just slip into our software. It starts to have real impacts in our devices. Uh, some of you may have heard the tale of the automated soap dispenser. It's only responding to uh, very light colored skin. Similarly, I have a good colleague in Toronto that talks about some of the testing that went on with automated vehicles in Toronto. Uh, she has a friend who uses a wheelchair, but happens to use the wheelchair in a way that many would call backwards. She scoots rather than pushes the wheels. And automated systems look at that uh, wheelchair user and they believe that she is headed in the forward direction. She ended up being hit by testing systems two to three times before they started to adapt this. Why do I bring this up, right? I mean, we don't believe that any sorts of individuals are intentionally building racist soap dispensers. No one's looking out in the world trying to build uh, robot murder taxis. And yet, one of the first things that I learned as a software engineer is that human beings make mistakes, arguably the nature of being human. So that as a good engineer, we accept that, we account for it, and we plan for it. And what that means in the case of the kinds of biases that we might introduce into our learning algorithms is that we can't trust black box systems. Um, you know, that if a system is not open, we have no ways of knowing what kinds of problems have been introduced to it. Similarly, what kinds of biases. But with a real scientific approach, you know, a key part of that is transparency. And this demands open, reproducible, provable algorithms. Um, to take that black box approach is antithetical to science and really sets us up to have real challenges down the road. So when you're thinking about courseware, think about open content. Also think about the underlying systems that are going to drive it uh, and make sure that they're transparent and open. David? Uh, yeah, we also wanted to say, and I'll also hurry through these. Uh, these are the last slides that even if you're not able to adapt or adopt adaptive courseware, you can still do some of the kinds of things that we're talking about using other tools in your LMS or ones provided by Google. Norman, if you'll advance here. I just want to talk about, for example, how to do some of the kind of connecting with students work that I was describing from Lumen's Waymaker platform a minute ago, if you're inside, uh, working inside the LMS. You know, first that would constitute deciding what kind of messages you want to send. Um, and well, just let me get to the example. Thank you, Norman, for prompting me forward here. So you know, if I wanted to send a, hey, can we talk? Because you're struggling message to students. Um, you know, I need to decide who I'm going to send to people who score lower than 80. I'll put on my calendar to do that every Monday morning. So I, you know, always remember to do it. And then I'll go into my LMS and this is what it'll look like, assuming I'm using Canvas. Go ahead, Norman. So here's some data for an example student. If I actually go up and hover, right there and click, then you'll see that a little menu will open that say message students who. And if I click on message students who, now I can use this drop down to say, for example, students who scored less than, you know, so many points here. And then I could paste whatever templated message I had written into here. Still manual, um, certainly quicker than uh, getting to everybody, uh, you know, trying to send those emails one at a time. It only provides quiz level insight as opposed to insights at the individual learning outcome level, but you could still do something like this to connect with your struggling students and help them understand that you care about them, even if you're not able for whatever reason to adopt adaptive courseware. And then the second example is coming back to Norman's uh, muddiest point uh, that we were talking about. And if you don't have, if that's not something that's built into the content you're using right now, or you're not sure how to do that in your learning management system, super easy to set up something like this using Google Forms. Um, where you just say, hey, for week two, here are the main topics that we talked about. Rate your own confidence in how well you understood things. Um, and very quickly kind of collect that feedback, even do some open-ended things if you wanted to there, and then collect that data. And again, you can take this kind of data into the classroom and show, I think on the next slide here, show students, hey, here's what you all said. It seems like everybody was kind of getting this. People are feeling like they're struggling. Here, so I'm going to spend the bulk of time in class today talking about this topic because you told me that this is what, you know, where you where you were struggling. You said that in the qualitative data as well, and it's also what I see, uh, you know, kind of in the gradebook. So there are ways that you can do some of these things outside of adaptive systems. Granted, they're more manual. You have to set them up. You have to remember 
to do them as opposed to having it all be automated and more granular. Um, but there are ways to do a lot of these things. So having said that, I think we want to reserve the rest of the time for questions or conversation or just anything you want to talk about related to adaptive, active learning uh, asynchronously online. And feel free to use the chat or uh, if you've got a mic, feel free to unmute and ask that way. Jump on. And sorry, we'd hope to uh, finish this piece up a little earlier so we get to hearing from you and uh, our first time through this deck. So we, we, we ran just a little bit long. I noticed that uh, many of you uh, jumped on Alex as an example of adaptive courseware, and it sounds like um, that might be a common use case. I'm wondering, can anyone talk about uh, some, some techniques they've been using in other systems to uh, connect, whether Alex or elsewhere? But not all at once. One of the things that our Center for Teaching and Learning uh, has attempted to hammer into my head is to not fear silence. Ask a question, give people a chance to answer. You can see that I haven't actually uh, internalized that yet. Okay. Um, this summer I was teaching second semester general chemistry and uh, I fast-paced course, especially during the summer, and completely online. Um, so every week I, I ended it with a, a little plea in our synchronous session to fill out something like um, what you just showed, a, uh, a little survey of muddiest points, what, what are you getting, what needs to be discussed in, in greater detail. And I would put a due date of like Sunday night, and then on Monday when we met again, I said, hey, this is what you guys said. We're going to tailor today's lesson to cover these points. You have a quiz tomorrow. Get ready. <laughs> you know, because it's online summer. Um, but, um, you know, that, uh, that's something that I did recently. And I'm going to try and uh, do that this coming semester as I teach General Chemistry 1. And, and it's, if you're repeating it, you're, I'm thinking you found it uh, effective? Uh, I, I, it seemed like uh, students responded well, kind of like how you were discussing it, uh, to you know me probing them about what what is connecting, what isn't connecting, and also Monday seemed to be the day when I said, "Hey, look look at your homework. You know this was the most missed homework program uh, problem. Let's go back and cover that." And you're telling me on the the survey the same thing or something else that I didn't think was a problem. No. no, I think that's that's been my experience as well. And I, uh, I, I, I just finished CS1 for the summer session and that six week pace is brutal. Uh, and, and so many of the things that I would normally do in the class to make those kinds of connections and frankly, gain that kind of trust so that they're telling me where they're struggling are even harder to do online. So I really found that the tools were helpful. Um, and before we leave that point, um, I think just the fact of standing up in front of the class, whether it's you know physically or virtually, and saying, hey guys, I went back and I looked at the data because I care about whether you're learning or not. And so I took some time to explore there and I appreciate the time that you spent responding to my survey. And I, you know, I think I figured out where you're struggling the most and I'd like to spend some time really focused there today because I care about you guys learning the stuff that we're discussing in class. Just the, the act of showing your students that you care, that you're engaging in activities, that you're going out of your way, you're doing things to try to see how they're learning and to support their better learning, just communicating to them that you care about whether they're learning or not goes a huge way toward kind of getting students on board um, emotionally with you for everything that's coming in the semester. And as you continue to engage in those little practices and demonstrate, you actually care about whether they're learning or not, and you're going out of your way to tailor and to work with them, it, uh, it just makes a really big difference. It's counterintuitive in some ways that we're able to use the technology to deepen those kinds of human connections. Um, but, uh, you know, this is this actually ends up being one of the things that it excels at. I, um, I continue to be a skeptic that our best use of uh, human technology is to simply pick the next math problem to hand a uh, to hand to a student when we're able to take these kinds of approaches, hopefully get better insights into where they're struggling and use that in a more human way. 
May I ask a question in, in, some, in a slightly different way? So Mark Cooper Smith, and uh, the topic I teach entrepreneurship is much more qualitative in nature. There aren't right and wrong answers. There are better and worse approaches and it's highly team oriented. So I use a lot of the tools as far as polling and chat to do that. I use breakout groups a lot. Um, I do some simulations that I've been able to find. But beyond that, how do we, for topics like this that don't lend themselves to branching or some of the areas you've been discussing, how do we approach that using some of the tools or at least the approaches and what might be some resources we would look to? So one of the examples that I showed uh, was a course in evidence-based management, uh, and I, I, we actually see this used a lot in some of our uh, entrepreneurship classes at CMU. So I, I'd suggest taking a look at it, not necessarily because the content itself is useful to you, uh, but because you might see some of the models and approaches that are being taken there, and those might be useful to you. Uh, but I also think that what we've been seeing with my Simon initiative hat on has been more and more of an interest in how we can support compute, how we can drive better computer supported collaborative learning. Uh, as just one example, there's an open source tool called Bazaar, uh, Bazaar like market, uh, like strange, um, that one of my colleagues has developed uh, in which students are put into a scenario where they need to co-develop something, a slideshow on, uh, on green energy. And so they're working inside of a chat room, they're simultaneously building out a slide deck in Google Slides, and they've got a set of things they need to cover, right? You know, work through the pros and cons of different energy types, talk about policy. In the chat room with them is an artificial agent, a little bot that is monitoring what they're doing, trying to pull in the students who aren't uh, engaging with the rest of the class, telling them when they're missing some points or saying, hey, you guys seem to have really covered this, maybe move on to the next topic. That bot then can be analyzed, is, is keeping track and is able to do some analysis of these logs to give you some information as an instructor on how did this learning activity play out? What are some spots students were spending more or less time on? And so that can give you some insight in the classroom. It also over the longer term can start to give you some insights on how these activities play out online. And I think that that's one of the most important things we can do with, the, with, with these data streams is use them to get a better sense of what's happening when we're not in the room, what's happening when we don't have eyes on our learners and be able to adapt in that, set, in that case. So those are two examples. David, sorry, I'm long-winded. No, and I, I know we're just about out of time, so I'll just say quickly, you know, as you're thinking about how to do more active learning, think about what are the actual activities that entrepreneurs engage in when they go out and entrepreneurize and try to find ways you know, to have students break into small groups and do that work together because entrepreneurs seldom, despite lone wolf mythology, uh, you know, they typically are working in teams with co-founders. No, it's, it's, it's very team oriented. And one of the things that you said, which is actually reminded me just kind of you know, very briefly is a focus on online collaboration tools like Google, the various Google tools, so they can all be working together at the very least, even though they're remote as opposed to working together around a table. So just utilizing those should be very helpful. Uh, and those kinds of skills, you know, collaboration, communication, teamwork, um, whether we talk about those as core competencies, 21st century skills, um, I hate the phrase soft skills because they're so important. Uh, you know, we're seeing that with the changing nature of work, finding better ways to, to teach those is, is really important. We can't rely on our students just rubbing up against each other and figuring it out uh, over a four year period. We've been approaching that through what we call a sidecar model. So trying to build smaller standalone pieces of ed tech that can be dropped into other courses. So in this case, we have a very short set of modules on collaboration that students work through together that might get dropped into an entrepreneurship course or a chemistry course where they have a group project. And so there are, there are a number of sidecars out there that might be interesting and useful to take advantage of. Uh, Norman and David, uh, we are at one o'clock. I don't know if you wanna chat your email addresses in uh, in the box in case anybody wants to follow up. But I just want to say that we sincerely thank you for this presentation and for giving uh, us ways of connecting with students um, in really an, uh, almost an elegant and seamless way on the OLI and Waymaker platforms, but even beyond outside of those things, things that we can do. And so um, I hope that the audience found it helpful. And uh, again, really appreciate you joining us and everybody joining us uh, at such a busy time. 
So we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you next week if possible for our humanizing online teaching uh, webinar and have a, uh, a wonderful uh, weekend um, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks all.